Hi, everyone, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Fred Foley, who will be talking to us today about understanding and managing cognitive changes. After a presentation from Dr. Foley, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Frederick Foley received his PhD in clinical psychology from Fordham University. He's a professor of psychology at Forkuff, Furkuff Graduate School of Psychology of Yeshiva University, Bronx, New York, and the director of neuropsychology at Holy Name Medical Center's MS Center. He has published over 150 scientific articles, book chapters, and abstracts, and his translational research on depression and immune desegregation, deregulate, dysregulation, forgive me, in MS, won the Dorkman Award from the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. He has served on the Medical Advisory Committee of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and served as president of the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers, the CMSC. The CMSC dedicated an actual award in his name, the Fred Foley Award, which is given annually to a person who has con contributed greatly to advances in treatment for neuropsychiatric disorders in multiple sclerosis. Dr. Foley also received a giant of MS award from the CMSC in 2022 for his work. He has been the recipient of numerous research and educational grants from the federal government and private foundations, has served on many scientific committees and has been an advisor on cons or consultant for numerous for-profit and non-profit organizations on MS-related topics. We're so pleased to have him join us today, and we'd love for him to continue talking about his, his important topic. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Deborah. I'm going to now <clears throat> share my screen so that the participants can see the slides those of you that have access to video. <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to talk about cognition in MS. Um, and so there are frequently some cognitive changes that take place in MS, and people always ask me, well, how often does that occur? And there have been a no number of studies that looked at the epidemiology or frequency of cognitive changes in MS. And generally speaking, if we sum those studies together, somewhere between 34% to 65% of adults with MS will have some cognitive changes. And about a third of children with MS, uh, children you know, under 18 years old, will have cognitive changes in MS. <clears throat> so, and these estimates, kind of vary because there are different studies and they have different samples and they uh, and that's the way kind of epidemiological studies occur. And so that's why you have these different estimates. We're going to talk about what cognitive changes occur shortly, but in terms of the patterns of cognitive changes, <clears throat> we know they occur in all MS, um, you know, uh, progressive forms, relapsing forms, a clinically isolated syndrome, which is a kind of very early prodromal of MS. <clears throat> they're highly variable in their severity, and they're highly variable in their progression. So, uh, and basically, when we do repeat studies over time, once someone has some cognitive changes, we will see them worsen over a period to, of 10 to 20 years. <clears throat> So uh, how severe do they occur? As I said, it's variable. So um, many, many patients have no cognitive changes whatsoever in MS. And the most of those that do, they're either mild to moderate in nature. <clears throat> the cognitive changes in MS rarely are severe. Like if you have Alzheimer's disease or uh, a kind of a severe neurodegenerative disorder such as that, everybody's going to get severe cognitive changes. Not so in MS. Many patients won't have any, uh, most of whom that have it will have mild to moderate changes. So 
the areas that get affected, you know, uh, most frequently. Probably uh, the two most important areas that that uh, where changes take place in MS include information processing speed, how quickly we can process information in the brain. And the reason, most likely reason for this is as we know, MS is a demyelinating disease. It, it, although it affects other areas of the brain besides myelinated tracts, um, it's, it heavily affects those areas of the brain that are myelinated. And myelin is a, um, it, it speeds the nerve action potential down the neuron. It propagates the electrical charge. So when myelin is compromised, those nerve action potentials cannot propagate as quickly down the neuron. Um, so, so that's probably what's underlying, you know, why information processing speed slows down in MS. <clears throat> Memory is another area that gets affected in MS most commonly. So, um, you know, you might notice at times that you find things on the tip of your tongue. Well, I find that every day. I can't recall the exact word I'm looking for. So uh, it's it's not those kinds of normal things that take place, but it's over and above those things. Um, most people have had the experience of they walk into a room and they forget what they walked in there for. So the memory problems we're talking about are not these everyday lapses that you know you know many people tend to have. Um, it's, it's kind of amplified memory memory problems. And there are different types of memory. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit, the different types of memory and how they get affected in MS. <clears throat> there are some other cognitive symptoms that uh, uh, can occur in MS besides speed of information processing and memory. And oh, by the way, uh, if your information processing speed is impacted, it's likely that you're going to have some memory changes as well. And the reason for that is if you can't process information quickly, it's going to be hard to get it into memory in the first place. So many times people will come in for neuropsychological evaluation. They'll tell me I have a memory problem. I'll test them and uh, say, no, you don't have a memory problem. You have a processing speed problem. <clears throat> and they say, well, why is my memory so bad? And I said, well, um, under the ideal conditions of neuropsychological testing, your memory is okay. But, you know, if you're trying to process information quickly, you know, in everyday life, you're, you're not going to be able to encode it all properly into memory. So it'll feel like you have a memory problem, but it's really another aspect of cognition that's affecting indirectly your ability to remember things in the same way that you used to. <clears throat> Other kinds of things that can occur. Changes in complex attention. Complex attention is when you're kind of, um, uh, you know, not just having to pay attention to one thing, but having to kind of multitask, pay attention to multiple things. So, uh, you know, that would be an example of uh, an area that gets affected by MS as well. Executive functioning is another area of cognition that can get impacted. And executive functioning is problem solving ability, cognitive flexibility, you know, the ability to suppose, uh, supposedly think outside of the proverbial box, you know, that kind of creative uh, thinking. Those, all those things are considered under executive functioning. And sometimes that can get impacted in MS as well. <clears throat> Verbal fluency, you know, being able to say what you want to say uh, can also get affected. That uh, if you have a lot of times, as I said, when you have a word on the tip of your tongue and you can't get it out, and you can't quite uh, recall what it is and say it, that's an example of a verbal fluency issue. Um, visual spatial perception is another area of change that can occur. And visual spatial a perception uh, <clears throat> kind of it, it includes a lot of different things. Like, for example, um, when you're parking your car, how close are you to the curb? 
That would be visual spatial perception. Um, solving kind of visual puzzles would be another example of it. Uh, visual judgment, you know, uh, how close or how far things are together or apart. So those kinds of things can get affected as well. And what we've learned in the last few years, there's something called social cognition that can get in, impacted. An example of social cognition would be able to, being able to kind of read other people's body language well, or understand from their facial expressions what they're feeling. So those are actually complex cognitive tasks, being able to uh, read somebody's body language, being able to kind of uh, look at their face and have an understanding of what their likely feeling state or emotional state is. And we do this automatically all the time. And uh, actually, you know, most of the information we take in about another person is more visually based than verbally based. So and when those kinds of things can get impacted, like you, know, you can't tell what people are feeling anymore and you can't read their body language, then your communication with others can, you know, become off a little bit. And so uh, we call this social cognition, and we know that these can occur, uh, changes in social cognition can also occur in MS. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, uh, comparing, um, you know, relapsing, remitting MS patients to uh, primary progressive MS patients, these are these areas, some of the areas of memory that were of, and uh, thinking that were uh, evaluated in um, a very large study uh, with 101 MS patients and 415 matched healthy controls. In a study like this, you compare the performance on <clears throat> age and education matched uh, MS patients to people who have similar age and educational status, you know, uh, as a control group to see which one performs, you know, uh, more poorly on which particular tasks. And in this study, uh, compared to healthy controls, uh, if you look at the at the uh, vertical column here, and you'll see the type of cognitive uh, problem that was evaluated. And if you look at the um, horizontal axis, you'll see the percent of patients that had problems in this area compared to healthy controls. So if you look at visual construction abilities, you can see that relapsing patients in primary progressive MS patients had about the same level of uh, impairment in it. And um, compared to healthy controls, it was about 10% of MS patients had impairments in that, in that area. So this might mean if you have an impairment in that area, maybe you'll get in a few more fender benders or hit the curb with your car or forget you know, um, people's faces that you've met before and not being able to um, recall them. Visual episodic uh, memory. Uh, episodic memory is memory that naturally occurs in our day-to-day -day activities. So it's being able to remember, you know, who was at your last birthday party, for example. It's able to kind of re remember normal everyday things as we go about living. Our memory is constantly working and constantly engaging. And so um, episodic memory is, you know, what we're remembering in the course of everyday events and our ability to recall it later. For example, uh, who starred in a movie that you recently watched or what was the plot theme and things, things of that sort. <clears throat> um, so, there, so there's visual episodic memory and verbal episodic memory. Visual episodic memory is, uh, you know, kind of rem remembering where you parked your car at the mall so you can go out you know, after you're shopping and find it. Uh, verbal episodic memory, you know, might be um, kind of remembering someone's name you were, uh, you were introduced to recently. And as you can see by the little star in the chart, you know, uh, there's a difference here between relapsing remitting MS patients on verbal episodic memory 
and primary progressive patients. Compared to healthy controls, the um, relapsing patients, about 10% of them had um, an impairment in verbal episodic memory. And in the primary progressive patients, well, about 30% did. And so that was that, that's a, a significant uh, disability. And they did control for disability level in, in, this, in this study. So uh, another area where there was a significant difference between, uh, be, between uh, primary progressive MS patients and healthy controls, as, as well as, um, excuse me, just one moment. Okay, um, was an executive function. And if you look under executive function on the chart, you'll see uh, only about 5% of relapsing patients had an impairment in executive functioning, while uh, about, you know, between 15 and 20% of primary progressive patients had this change in executive function. If you remember, executive function is your problem solving ability, your ability to plan, organize uh, things, and um, uh, have kind of flexibility in your problem solving. So <clears throat> working memory also gets affected. This is a, another type of memory where you're holding information temporarily kind of uh, uh, in, your, in your mind while you're you know, trying to uh, figure something out. So working memory, you, you're remembering something only while you're working on that particular topic, and then you're going to forget it. So, but working memory is is important, um, you know, uh, for problem solving at times. And so, uh, it's an, another aspect of of memory. This temporary holding of information that soon will be forgotten, <clears throat> and that's necessary to hold the information in order to uh, problem solve. Okay, so. Uh, as you can see here, about the same amount of relapsing patients as primary progressive patients have working memory issues, and it's about 15 to 17%. Attention, attention problems, uh, you know, being able to focus on something without getting distracted. Uh, and you can see here between 10 and 15% of, of patients have that issue. <clears throat> and uh, there's no difference between relapsing and primary progressive patients on this. Now, when we get to information processing speed, and as I said earlier, this is really the most common uh, cognitive problem in MS, you know, slowing down your ability to process information. So, uh, and there's no significant difference between relapsing patients and uh, progressive patients, but, you know, around 35 to over 40% of patients have this issue. <clears throat> we know that cognitive problems in MS can impact daily functioning. You know, uh, with children that get MS, it can worsen their performance in school. Or, um, you know, for adults who get MS, it can uh, worsen your performance at your, at your job, <clears throat> depending on what your job is and how cognitively demanding it is. So, uh, but cognitive impairments are associated with increased rates of unemployment uh, in persons with MS. Reduced participation in activities. You know, people with cognitive problems, <clears throat> you know, they might tell me something like, well, I don't like to go to a big party. There's so much noise and and people are talking at the same time. I just can't process all that information uh, anymore. So um, I'm kind of like, a, a, you know, a visitor there, but I can't, I'm not a participant in the, in the party or in the social gathering. So <clears throat> there is some reduced participation in activities that uh, is associated with this. Also, if you have that visual spatial problem that we talked about, or attention problems you know, and information processing speed problems, well, 
it could impair your driving ability. And there, it has been found that there's an increased risk of motor vehicle violations and accidents for people with MS who have cognitive impairments, you know, and particularly in those areas, you know, attention, if you're not paying attention when you're on the road or you can't do it, or, and if your information processing speed is slow, so you can't kind of process uh, something that you need to react to very quickly, you know, it can be associated with the problems with driving. Um, also, uh, and cognitive impairments are associated with, uh, um, you know, a compromised medical decision making. That is, you know, not taking care of yourself to the best that you can, um, and and it's associated with poor adherence to taking your disease modifying therapies. So, there, if you have a cognitive impairment, people are less consistent. You know, they for, they forget to go to their appointment or they forget to take their disease modifying therapy. <clears throat> also associated with uh, reduced money management skills. And um, in the literature, it's been found that there's increased uh, distress on caregivers, uh, MS partners or givers when cognitive impairments occur. So um, there, fortunately we have excellent screening tests for cognitive impairments. And um, probably the best one is a test called the symbol digit modalities test. And this measures a cognitive processing speed, which is that most common impairment we were discussing earlier. And basically what it, the task does, it pairs specific numbers with geometric figures. And um, so, and you, you, have, you have a learning period of time where you can see the number nine is paired with a triangle, for example, or the number eight is paired with a square, you know, for example. And then you're given a sheet of paper where you only have the symbols and not the numbers. And so you have to kind of look up at the reference line and as rapidly as you can kind of write the numbers under the under the blank symbols on the test component of the of it. And um, it's been well validated in children and in adults with MS. It takes at most five minutes to complete. And uh, it's good to follow patients over time with this, you know, uh, because it's very brief, can easily be done in the clinic setting. And we know from research that if there's a four point drop in the score, or a 10% drop in the score, that that means that there's something clinically meaningful going on and that patients should be referred for, you know, a full neuropsych testing so that a treatment plan can be devised for them. Um, and the SDMT, uh, you, you know, predicts employment status and the ability to, uh, the, the individual's capacity to fully engage in all the activities of daily living that we normally engage in. Okay, uh, and if it's sensitive to change during a clinical relapse, if you have a clinical relapse, your SDMT might go down uh, temporarily. So, uh, so this is an excellent screening test. Uh, there are other screening tools that have been validated in MS as well. Um, I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them because, uh, you know, these, this is important for, um, you know, your healthcare providers to know the research on, and uh, they'll decide which one to use in their clinic. So if you go and ask your neurologist or your MS nurse, hey, are you giving me the SDMT? They may say, no, we give the processing speed test here, or we give a computerized speed cognitive test here, or we give uh, other tests. So, you know, um, Again, there have been many that have been validated and they're excellent screening tools in MS. <clears throat> so um, now in terms of longer neuropsychological test batteries, and I'm talking about neuropsychological testing because that's the way you really assess if cognitive changes have taken place over time, you know, uh, or due to, the, due to the multiple sclerosis. A screening tool you know, as you know, kind of can get, detect the probability 
of you having a problem. But then, you know, if there's a high probability of having a problem, I mean, this is why uh, women get mammograms or uh, men have their uh, prostate specific antigen, you know, tested. These are screening tests that could test for potential uh, bigger problems. And then you go for a full assessment of that potential problem. So after you get your screening test in the clinic, say it's the SDMT and, you know, and it comes up being positive, well, then you're likely to be referred for, to a neuropsychologist for uh, neuropsychological testing. And there are, are, are many of these uh, batteries that have been uh, monitored, uh, developed for MS specifically. So um, probably the most common one given is the minimal assessment of cognitive function in MS. And it tests all the major domains, you know, that of cognition in MS. So this is probably the most comprehensive one. And as you can see from the chart, um, it tests the processing speed, both auditory and visual, verbal memory, uh, you know, learning and your ability to learn new information, and then your ability to recall the new information, visual spatial memory, you know, verbal fluency, spatial processing, and executive function are all tested in what we call the McFims battery. And there are other batteries as well that are briefer, but um, uh, don't give you all the information the McFims battery does. So if you're going to be referred for neuropsychological evaluation, you know, um, you have to expect to spend about 90 minutes, you know, getting the testing or, or, or perhaps even longer, depending on how comprehensive the battery will be. <clears throat> Also, if you are referred for neuropsychological testing, uh, it's important to make sure you bring your, your glasses with you or wear your contacts. It's important for you to you know, take your medicines as you're regularly scheduled to. Uh, and it's important to get a good night's sleep the night before if that's possible so that you know, uh, fatigue won't significantly interfere in your cognition scores that day. One of the things we know um, is that there are many things that interact with cognition that can cause, you know, seemingly cognitive problems. For example, many times we've had, uh, it, you know, patients come into our clinic, and I guess over the years, I or my uh, students or staff have tested thousands of patients on neuropsychological tests. And many of the times, patients will come and say, my memory's shot you know, it's really dropped. Can you help me? And I say, well, okay, let's test you, uh, give you a test battery. And we'll test them and we'll, I'll frequently find the patient is fine cognitively, they're just depressed. Because if you're clinically depressed, you know, which is you know, kind of like feelings of sadness, you know, most of the day, nearly every day, losing interest in the things that you could do that you uh, normally would be interested in, um, you know, feelings like that you know, and there may be other feelings associated with the clinical depression as well, like a feeling um, of helplessness and hopelessness. Um, and also when people get clinically depressed, they get, they, um, they, they get self-critical. They're, they're, they get very, very self-critical. So uh, all of these things, if you're experiencing them, could mean that you are depressed and it's important to get help for that because we know that depression is very common in MS. And uh, we also know it will temporarily impact your ability to think clearly, to pay attention to things, to remember things. And this is why when you, know, you go for a neuropsychological assessment, you know, they will also test you for depression because um, we know, uh, and I've had the experience where we frequently uh, treated the depression and the patient says, my memory is better now. You know, my cognition is improved now. So uh, that's the first thing we want to do. You know, if someone comes in and they have some cognitive changes and if we know they're depressed, we want to treat that depression. Similarly, anxiety is very common in MS and anxiety also impairs cognition. So um, 
you know, so we'll also test you for anxiety to see if you're very, very anxious. And if you are, we want to get that treated uh, well also because, uh, you know, frequently we won't have to do, you know, anything else to improve someone's memory except treat a mood disorder that they may have. Uh, fatigue, you know, as we all know, fatigue is very common in MS and uh, it also can significantly impact your ability to think clearly. You know, uh, many MS patients have talked about brain fog and uh, cognitive fatigue that they're experiencing. So we want to be able to test your fatigue level as well because we know this can affect your cognitive function. All of these things were important to assess for us to come up with a comprehensive treatment plan to improve your cognition. Um, some medications can uh, impact memory. Some bladder meds can impact your ability to learn and remember new things. So, um, uh, you know, and some other medications can as well affect your attention and concentration uh, and your ability to remember things. So we'll want to know what your medicines are on. And also, um, if you go to your uh, MS healthcare specialist and say, you know, uh, you know, my, th my thinking is changing, my memory is changing, you know, they'll probably take a look at what medicines you're on to see if something could be adjusted to uh, that may be affecting your memory. Uh, and, and other comorbid con uh, conditions can affect memory as well. Um, people go through life, they may not just have MS, they may get something else. So um, as well, that can, uh, that can affect their cognition. Uh, you know, I, I just got over COVID recently and um, for about a month, I could not attend or concentrate on anything. You know, my cognition was significantly impacted by the COVID. But that's an example of a comorbid condition that is likely to create a temporary, you know, cognitive problem. Now, research on cognition in MS has been looking in recent years into something we call cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve is the ability of the brain to tolerate, you know, pathology related to a disease without exhibiting overt signs of symp or symptoms. So basically, what this means is if you have better baseline cognitive reserve, you'll be able to adapt or compensate for changes caused by the disease, you know, or by normal aging. And we measure, a co so we know that if you stimulate the brain and you stimulate it well for years, for example, higher education is associated with greater cognitive reserve. So if you're getting lesions from MS, you're less likely to have cognitive deficits. So, uh, you know, and, and so we're, we encourage patients to kind of get lots of cognitive stimulation. And there's a lot of research being done right now to answer the question, can we improve or increase cognitive reserve in patients with MS to help buffer, you know, against potential memory uh, changes or cognitive changes that can be caused by the disease? So there's a lot of research being done on this question right now. Okay. Um, so, and basically there are uh, kind of guidelines for um, screening and assessing cognitive uh, function as part of a comprehensive MS care. And we recommend that everyone with MS get a baseline cognitive screening as soon as you're diagnosed um, uh, at a time when you're stable. We wouldn't want to assess you cognitively if you've been on high dose uh, steroids, for example, over the last month, because that will impair your attention and concentration. So, and then kind of uh, we recommend that there's uh, reassessments uh, generally on an annual basis uh, or more often as needed, you know, to kind of um, uh, screen for potential changes in cognition. We, and the reason why that's important is for so long uh, as a neuropsychologist, I was frustrated because I'd be referred an, a patient with MS after they lost their job. And I'll test them, okay, yes, this patient has cognitive changes. But this is why screening is important. If we can catch people before they have, you know, 
things like a loss of a job due to cognitive changes, we can frequently prevent or delay that change from happening by intervening in a way that will address the conditions that are affecting their ability to cognitively function. Like all those things I mentioned before, depression, anxiety, fatigue, and um, cognitive changes per se. Okay, so in terms of treatment of, of MS-related cognitive impairment, this is an area of tremendous research, you know, uh, you know, and more and more research projects over the last five years are really kind of yielding more and more information about it. And there are different types of cognitive rehabilitation or cognitive remediation. You know, patients ask me, well, what is that cognitive rehabilitation? I say, think of it as physical therapy for the brain. You know, we're going to uh, give your brain a workout to improve your memory, improve your thinking and ability. And there are different types. There's uh, restorative and compensatory approaches. Uh, restorative approaches want to directly improve the cognitive function that's impaired. For example, there's now some good evidence that demonstrates that memory can be directly improved by, um, a, by cognitive rehabilitation in MS, a type of cognitive re rehabilitation that is specifically designed to focus on and improve your memory. And I'll talk about that technique uh, shortly. And um, then there's compensatory types of cognitive rehabilitation. And compensatory types, well, they're not working, looking to um, you know, directly improve that targeted cognitive area, but they're looking to help you co compensate for that change in cognition so that um, you won't be bothered by it anymore. Um, for example, uh, I teach patients how to use personal organizers, how to, how to make lists, you know, so that they're not going to forget something, how to get uh, super organized in their lives, because that teaching organizational skills, um, you know, teaching patients how to keep track of everything when you have a poor memory, uh, you know, these things will compensate so that you'll be able to function, you know, better. Um, and uh, uh, it's, so it's not directly uh, addressing the cognitive change, but it's indirectly giving you tools to compensate for it so that your overall function can be improved. There's, uh, and so uh, just to give you a couple more examples of compensatory, you know, changes, uh, you know, uh, interventions that help people compensate, you know, a big one is, you know, learning to use your calendar. And uh, when I was at first teaching patients, you know, uh, how to compensate for their cognitive changes, I would say, well, what do you do? And they say, well, I keep, I keep lots of sticky notes, post-it notes. And um, I say, well, how well does that work? Not, re not really. And what I've learned is that uh, a lot of people keep posted notes. They just become like a mosaic, you know, uh, where you're kind of losing track of the, the individual items on them because there's so many of them. So one thing I teach patients so that uh, a compensatory approach is I ask them to make a list of things they want to do every day in the, in the beginning of the day. And then uh, as they go through their day, I ask them to kind of put in their calendar, well, what time of day do you want to get to that? Because, you know, MS fatigue tends to hit more in the afternoon and evening. So if you have something important or something that is going to be cognitive, challenge, cognitive challenging to you, it's important to do it in the morning or the time of day when you're least fatigued. Because remember, fatigue, we said fatigue interferes with cognition. So I help them organize their day around their symptoms to so that they'll get in the way the least. And also, um, you know, if something, you know, is important, you know, that you didn't get to that day, well, you don't forget about that item. You put it forward in your calendar so that it's not going to get left behind and you don't forget about it. So I'll have them do that. And uh, if they keep pushing things forward uh, long enough, I'll, I'll ask the question, well, how important is that to really get done at all? You know, maybe you can cross it off your list of things to do. And 
uh, and focus on just getting done those things that are truly important and meaningful to you. So that's just some examples of, uh, you know, compensatory approaches. And there are other approaches as well uh, for someone at work who was getting distracted a lot, um, you know, because he had some executive uh, impairments. I asked him to keep, you know, uh, have, have his watch or his phone kind of beep every 20 minutes and ask yourself the question, am I staying on track with what I wanted to do? Because he would lose track of what he was doing very easily. And that helped him. It, it helped reorient him to uh, the, the priority list that he had to get things done and uh, helped him stay on track. Another example of a compensatory approach. There's also growing evidence that exercise uh, may benefit memory in MS um, and cognitive impairments. So the the you know it's not really finalized in the literature as of yet. There's just uh, kind of some early studies that have shown we need to do larger kind of multi-site studies, which are which are actually underway right now, to uh, see can we improve cognition through exercise, particularly aerobic exercise. And the hypothesis here is that um, increased cardiorespiratory capacity and fitness, you're getting more oxygen to the brain, you know, uh, and you're getting uh, better vascular health in the brain. So that uh, that would be the mechanism by which it's most likely that if this early evidence pans out, that aerobic exercise um, <clears throat> can uh, improve cognition in MS. The jury's still out on that one, but we there's some promising early studies. So, but of course, if you're going to engage in aerobic exercise to improve your cognition and your overall health, you have to do it in a way that's respectful to your MS symptoms. You know, many patients have um, get uh, are heat sensitive, so and need to exercise in a way that is not going to um, uh, give them severe fatigue or uh, you know, kind of activate their underlying MS symptoms. It, it's not going to activate the disease. It's just going to activate, make you feel your symptoms more temporarily. So uh, unfortunately, there haven't been good uh, drugs to address cognition that have uh, found that they can improve cognition. We thought early on the stimulants, like those stimulants you give to, you know, people with ADHD, attention deficit disorder would, would help uh, attention in MS and cognition, but there's been very mixed results uh, of medication so far. Um, you know, probably the best meds, you know, to preserve cognition in the long run, you know, are the disease modifying therapies, you know, just as they can slow the progression of physical symptoms of MS and disability, you know, there's evidence that suggests they can slow the uh, onset and progression of cognitive symptoms in MS. So we hope that we'll be able to find some targeted therapies, uh, drug therapies for cognition directly in MS, but we haven't been able to successfully do that as of yet. One memory rehab technique I thought I would share with you is called the modified story memory technique. And uh, in, in this approach, what you do is if you have things you want to remember, you create a story about them and make sure you include the items. So uh, if I had a list of things to remember, such as, um, you know, a painting, church, um, a king, uh, the color red and blue, I might put an image in my mind's eye of a, a picture of a king, a a, a red and blue painting of a king on the wall of a church, you know, uh, to incorporate the elements that I have to remember and then see that in my mind's eye. So the modified story memory technique, you know, trains people to take items they have to remember, put them in a story of some sort. You know, uh, it could be a visual kind of image or it could be uh, a verbal story, you know, that you're, that you're doing. And uh, this, this, approach has been found in uh, a number of studies that it supports the effectiveness of this approach on memory function and quality of life in MS. Um, more studies are needed, 
uh, it doesn't seem to generalize to other areas of cognition, just, you know, uh, a memory. And it's, uh, the studies have been found, the changes in memory are associated with uh, increased uh, brain activation uh, detected on functional MRI in areas of the brain that are specific to learning and memory. So it seems to improve neural networking and improve, improve uh, brain activation in those areas uh, that are associated with learning and memory. So, uh, and again, there's much more research being done on this. And, uh, you know, we hope that there'll be some big breakthroughs in cognitive rehabilitation and improvements in cognition over the next five to 10 years. And I think on that note, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Foley. That was great information. So let me explain how our questions work. Uh, so now we are ready for questions. So, and I'm gonna repeat this a couple of times for anybody that doesn't get it the first time or forgets it. So speaking of cognition. So what you're gonna do is ask your question through the Q&A button in the app. And many of you know how to do this. So it's gonna be an easy peasy thing. Um, it also allows you to send your question anonymously if you like. And if you want to answer, do your question live, just raise your hand with the, the little raise hand button and I'll make sure that we unmute you. Um, and I think that's it. So let's go. Let's see how many we have. Let's see here. I, I do see one comment by uh, an attendee that says, uh, giving us feedback, being a person with cognitive challenges, this is a lot of information to process and a long time to focus and pay attention. You're absolutely correct. And uh, I, I believe, uh, I, I, I don't know if the recording of this will be available beyond today on Facebook, but if, if it is, you know, uh, available, Deborah, it, do you know yeah. whether this? We, well, okay. I know that we so watch it. I'm sorry, we record. Watch it, watch it multiple times. <laughs> exactly. That's one of the benefits. And I'll tell everybody at the end again, we record everything all of our Zoom presentations. We record it, we put it onto our um, SoundCloud. We also put it onto our YouTube channel and it will stay there for eternity. I think we keep it for years and years. So you will be able to go and you'll, if somebody else asked that question earlier while you were speaking, and I said that they'll be able to stop it, start it, stop it, start it, to be able to get the information that they need. Somebody, somebody had asked for you to go backwards one slide. And rather than interrupt you, I just said, you know, it's going to, it's going to keep going. You'll be able to take as much information as you want once it's on the YouTube. So, right. I, yeah, okay. I had one, I had one patient who uh, told me, you know, she kept forgetting what she was reading. And so I said, okay, just read a paragraph at a time and then read it twice and mm -hmm. see if that helps. And, and maybe you might have to read it a third time. So you have to get used to changing the way you behave in order to improve your learning and memory. Exactly. Aurora is asking, what kinds of exercises can we do on our own to improve cognition? Language study, lum lumosity? That's a very, very good question. You know, and um, what we believe is that the more you stimulate your brain, you know, through, you know, games and crossword puzzles and or challenging things, uh, you know, that it's certainly not going to hurt. You know, whether or not it will help, whether it will improve that cognitive reserve I talked about before, you know, we're still studying that and uh, to see exactly, you know, uh, if, it, if it can improve it. But, uh, uh, and again, there's lots and lots of cognitive games out there that uh, you can do since we don't have hardcore evidence that they will improve your cognition at this point. I suggest you get free or cheap ones to uh, uh, to work on those to stimulate your brain. And Margie's asking about the website. Uh, Marcy, we actually have msfocus.org, which is our website to get the SoundCloud, but the uh, YouTube channel, of course, is YouTube, um, what is it, www.youtube.org, I think, or .com on the YouTube. So. Uh, Catherine says, I have such hard time to take notes, typing or writing. It comes out as nonsense 
and apparently she has a tomb factive lesion on the left um, petrio, petrio. I don't know if probably that- Probably parietal, parietal lobe. Um, so, uh, okay, so it, it sounds like this is, you know, a significant problem for you. And I would strongly recommend if you haven't had a comprehensive neuropsychological assessment to get one. And so that they can uh, then develop a rehabilitation plan for you that will be comprehensive in nature because you may have other problems affecting your ability to take notes as well. And, uh, and that's why getting that comprehensive assessment is important, you know, uh, in order for your healthcare team to know how to approach helping you with that. Thank you. Uh, Margie wants to know, does doing art, Wordle, things like that help? They certainly will not hurt you, you know, and as I said, you know, there's currently research being done to see if we can, by doing things like this, by stimulating the brain, you know, on a daily basis with some challenging cognitive tasks, like a crossword puzzle or like a Wordle, uh, you know, we're hoping to find that that will improve cognitive reserve, which will help, you know, protect you from developing cognitive problems, even as your lesion load increases, or if it will. So, uh, you know, I can't definitively say because the research literature isn't there yet, but um, I would encourage you to do it. Um, do something cognitively challenging that you like. It's not gonna hurt and it may, you know, help. Good. Donald's asking, what about trying a memory drug like Prevagen? So, um, you know, there's no, there's no evidence that Prevagen helps memory, no scientific evidence. So, um, you know, in, in healthy people, uh, in aging people, or in any group of people that I'm aware of. So I'm not aware of any evidence that hey, Rhonda, suggests that that, that that helps. I know these, go ahead. No, 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 you can go ahead and finish. Okay. Thought you were done. So, I, start, say the next. I, I, I know that there's a lot of interest in supplements, you know, to kind of try to improve cognition and, and memory uh, in, uh, problems. But um, unfortunately, there's, there's no evidence in MS that any of these things work, but a lot of these things haven't been tested in MS either. Um, and there's actually very little evidence that they work in the general population as well. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't make a recommendation for you to take those kinds of things since there's uh, really no evidence to support it. If it makes you feel better take, and you can afford them, talk to your, tell your doctor you're taking them because some supplements can interact negatively with medications you may be taking. So if you're taking supplements to improve your memory or thinking in MS, please run them by uh, your healthcare team so that they can uh, let you know whether or not they will potentially interact with other meds you're taking or your pharmacist. Thank you. Rhonda is asking, is there a recommended amount of exercise to improve cognitive function? It's a very, very good question. So um, in the studies that um, are being done, you know, uh, the dosage of the uh, aerobic exercise is three to four times a week at 40 minutes. So uh, that's, that's, the dosage that's being conducted in the studies right now. So if you can do that three or four times a week for 40, 45 minutes, uh, that, would, that would be terrific. It's, and again, you just have to exercise in a way that isn't going to, uh, that hopefully will be fun and uh, won't kind of uh, exact, exacerbate your heat sensitivity if you are a heat sensitive MS patient, like swimming is good. Uh, because you weren't not going to get overheated or um, kind of if you're fast walking or doing or on an exercise machine to do aerobics uh, using cooling vests and cooling packs, you know, uh, can help keep your core body temperature down. So the exercise is very important, we believe, 
but doing it in a way that's safe and respectful of your MS symptoms is also very important. Melanie's asking, I think this is really interesting too, can years of vitamin B12 deficiency prior to an MS diagnosis contribute to cognitive impairment? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question, yeah. Severe vitamin B12 deficiencies in the general population have been found to be associated with cognitive impairment. So if you've had severe um, vitamin B12 deficiencies, it is a possibility that maybe that uh, con contributed. Of course, it, it's kind of impossible to tell, you know, and to separate out uh, memory changes from MS from memory changes that might have kind of uh, contributed to that, you know, prior to the MS. Hmm. So um, Margie said, I think she's referring to someone, but she said, I, I think she's saying, can you dictate your notes to Siri to help with note-taking? That's smart. It sounds like a great idea. I didn't know Siri did that. So, yeah. uh, wow, that's terrific. Good, I good idea. I mean, using technology is, uh, you know, whatever technology is available to kind of assist you in those compensatory approaches are great. Anna says, when I've been in conversation for a while and my brain gets overloaded, overwhelmed, I have a hard time remembering to use my filter. This is in regards to saying things that are triggering for my friend, i.e. talking about mutual friends involved in marital infidelity, tips on how to be able to have conversations with friends without withdrawal for fear of saying the wrong thing. Right. You know, uh, we, when we were talking about executive functioning before, one other aspect of executive functioning is being able to have that filter, being able to inhibit, you know, what's on our mind at the moment and not just say it. So, um, and again, as we mentioned before, fatigue can uh, temporarily exacerbate cognitive problems. So it sounds like you get fatigued, you get tired, and um, or kind of little overwhelmed and then that impacts your your executive functioning so uh, that would be um in terms of you know how to how to address that you know i i would have to ask you to uh, go get assessed and so and have a, a treatment plan you may have other issues that are affecting your executive functioning in moments like that and um it's, it's always best to get an assessment first, you know, so that you can get a comprehensive plan that will, you know, uh, maximize the benefit for you. Thank you. Apparently, Margie saw on a commercial that Prevagen did, did do that, that it was going to help. So she wrote another false commercial. So there you go. Yeah. You know, I haven't looked at the literature on Prevagen in about a year. Maybe something came out in the last year, but you know, that shows something. But prior to that, there were absolutely no good, no well designed studies on it. I mean, in the re research literature, there are different levels of evidence and there are different levels of studies. Some studies are very poor and uh, and poorly executed so that you, you know, really can't reach much of a scientific conclusion from it and many studies are excellently designed like uh, uh, those studies on that modified story technique many of them have been well designed that has uh, that has preliminarily shown to help improve memory Claudia made a comment that exercises with opposite arms and hands, legs and feet has been suggested to help the brain reserve. Yes, you know, there's a, there's a lot of exploration right now in what type of exercise will maximize, you know, uh, improving cognitive reserve. So um, generally speaking, you know, uh, kind of large movements with your limbs you know, either by swimming or kind of uh, uh, on exercise equipment or just walking with swinging your arms, that'll give you more of an aerobic effect. And, uh, uh, and, and that's kind of what we believe will be kind of helping the cognitive reserve. Leslie wrote that 
she's read in an MS magazine that breaking up the 45 minutes up into manageable times can be just as beneficial, such as 15 minutes three times a day instead of 45 minutes at a time. And they want to know if she wants to know if you agree. This way might be easier for those who are a little more physically disabled. Yes, if you can't do 45 minutes or 30 minutes because of your disability, that's really smart to do it in smaller doses of time uh, that you can handle. You know, you'll still get the benefits of it and you'll be doing it in a way, as I said before, that is respectful of your MS symptoms. And going back to Siri, uh, Margie said that Stumble to Rise, that's the name of the book by Gina Fletcher about her MS, she dictated her book to Siri. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, the exercise that helps the best is the exercise that you will do, right? Thanks, yes. Mark. Yep, makes sense. I appreciate that. I was uh, working with a, uh, an MS patient not too long ago who told me that um, she didn't have time to exercise, that she was, uh, that was, she was too busy. So I asked her, well, tell me what your day is like. She said, well, I have to get up early every day and go to work. And I, and so I, I walk my dogs in the morning before I go to work. And, you know, she was fully ambulatory. She had some weakness and, uh, and fatigue and some other uh, symptoms. She had some mild spasticity and um, some sensory paresthesias in her legs. Uh, I said, oh, you walk your dogs every morning for how long? She said, 20 minutes. I said, walk a little faster. You know, you, you know, the definition of aerobic exercise is just increasing your respiration rate, your breathing rate, and your heart rate, and uh, just increase that a little bit. And so uh, by the time I got done with the conversation, she realized that she could work in her aerobic activity uh, without it taking an extra minute of her day. So, um, and this is where kind of a consult with a physical therapist is excellent because they'll have lots of ways that they can teach you to uh, get that exercise in, you know, uh, and to do it in a way that's respectful of your MS symptoms. Right, we have one last question and that's um, asking, are there any foods that you recommend for brain function? Okay, the, um, uh, again, I am not a nutritionist, so I'm really not qualified to answer that question, but um, uh, my nutritionist colleagues, you know, tell me that more plant-based foods and foods high in omega-3 fatty acids like salmon, uh, sardines, things like that are good for the brain. But as I said, I am not a nutritionist, so I can't really answer that question for you. Wonderful. Thank you. So that's all the time we have for now. If you've missed any part of this conference, it's going to be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page and on our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference is going to be Tuesday, August 9th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. The speaker will be Dr. Ben Thrower, who will be answering as many of your questions as he can within the one hour that we give him. Um, our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation, especially to Dr. Foley, for, who was the kind person who came and took time out of his busy schedule to do this for us today. He's also gonna be doing, I believe, three more. We're gonna divide you up every couple months you're gonna be, and if you um, check, we'll be sending out messages and, and information about those also. So we look forward to those. Um, let's see, at the end of this program, when you leave, there's gonna be a question as to whether you'd like to fill out a very short survey. And the importance of that is so that we can find meaningful things for you to listen to. We wanna make sure we get those answers from you rather than coming up with them ourselves. So please take those two seconds to do that. We would appreciate it. And I believe that's it. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you once again, Dr. Foley, for doing this with us. And uh, I hope we see everyone again. Thank you. You're welcome, Deborah. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.